All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here bright and early Thursday morning of coverings. Um, I have a few housekeeping items I would like to go over with you before we start. If you could turn off or set your phones to vibrate, uh, please complete the session evaluations that are in the coverings app as it um, helps us to collect your feedback. If you would like to record CEUs for this session, at the back of the room there's a table um, where you can find information on CEUs or you can ask your room monitor out in the hall for assistance or the speaker ready room, which is across the hall over here in N115. Um, we are scanning badges to confirm attendance. So if you were able to get in here and you didn't have your badge scanned, make sure you do if you'd um, like to get CEUs. And then be sure to visit the show floor for some additional educational opportunities. Um, all of that information is in the mobile app. And then I also would like to mention the industry fundraiser that we have going on right now for the Ukrainian children. If you go by the TCNA bo um, pavilion booth, um, you can donate money. Uh, there's a link where you can pay by credit card online or you can give cash or check. Um, and all of the money will go to help um, Ukrainian children right now. So uh, now what you all came here for, I'd like to introduce um, Gene Marks. He uh, is with the Marks Group PC. Uh, he's going to be speaking about growth 2022, actions, tactics, and strategies to grow your business in a growing economy. Um, for the past 12 years, Gene Marks has written on small business, the economy, public policy, technology, and workplace issues for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Forbes, Entrepreneur, and The Guardian. A certified public accountant and former senior manager at KPMG, Jean has run, since 1994, a highly successful 10-person financial and technology management consulting firm near Philadelphia and speaks regularly to business groups nationwide on issues and trends affecting them. He also frequently appears on MSNBC, Fox Business, <clears throat> Sirius Radio, WABC Radio, and CNBC. Gene is the author of six best-selling books on business management, including In God We Trust, Everyone Else Pays Cash, and The Small Business Book of Lists. So please join me in welcoming Gene. Thank you. Good morning. True or false, guys, in 1969, the Apollo 11 astronauts were required to fill out customs forms before returning to Earth. You want to guess? You would think it'd be false. Actually, it's true, believe it or not. And look, this is the actual customs form that they had to fill out before returning. It literally said they departed the moon on July 24th this was before, so when we talk about, I, I cover immigration and things like that in the, you know, this has been going on for a long time, okay? So no, no, nothing, really, nothing really new there. Hey, let's try this one. True or false? In 1974, so that his 3,000-year-old mummy could be flown to Paris for necessary repairs, the pharaoh Ramses II was issued a valid Egyptian passport. Yeah, it is true, you, right? It is true, by the way. That's the passport that was issued to the pharaoh. And by the way, just as a coincidence, that's Keith Richards. Just want to write something. Okay, right. One more. True or false? 10% of Americans think that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. Yeah. It's a trick question. It's actually false. It's 7% of Americans think that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. Um, as I was, oh, and true or false, the average small business has six months of cash on hand. Yeah, that is false. You guys want to guess what it is? It's about two months. It's about two months, which is what we're going to talk about today. So I run a company outside of Philly. Um, we have 10 employees, about a dozen contractors, been in business for about 20 years, and I write in a lot of different places. We have about 600 clients in my company, and I speak to thousands of business owners and managers and leaders and executives all around the country and online at you know, presentations that I give and just you know, for, the, for the reporting that I do. Um, and, and, and I talk to them about you know, issues that they have running their businesses and things that I write about, right? On taxes and public policy and all that kind of stuff. One thing that has 
uh, you know, just, you know, I've been obsessed with over the past 10 years as a business owner is um, some of these guys have been around for like a long time. I mean, they have been, you know, you, and you know them, right? I mean, there are companies in your, like where you guys live that you, you, you drive by them and you're like, what is it established in 1851, established in 1854? I mean, that's on the long end. I mean, you hear all the statistics about businesses going out of business in five years and, you know, you know the rates of bankruptcies among small businesses. But, you know, I mean, there are a lot of companies out there, and you guys probably work for some of these yourselves, that, that they've been around for decades. They've passed down the business to different generations. They have you know, fathers and mothers and sons and daughters that, that run these companies and grandchildren as well. And I've, I've been obsessed with that as a business owner myself with kids like what is it like what is the secret sauce what what do these guys know that that I don't about running a business successfully for so long and I figured it out and I figured it out recently over the past couple of years you know, it, it just so it's no surprise all of these successful people all the people that have been around for a while they're you know they, they work hard they get up early they're good with uh, employees they're innovative they're you know whatever but there is one thing that they all have in common. And that one thing is this. They are always looking ahead. That's what the smartest clients I have, the smartest readers that I talk to, that is what they're doing. We are here in April of 2022 right now, and we're, the, the, the people that I know that are running successful companies, they're not really thinking about 2022 anymore. They're thinking about 2023 and 2024 and 2025 because they know that the stuff that's going on now in the economy, in Washington, in their local politics, in the world itself has an impact on them, and they're trying to make decisions where to spend their money and how to spend their time, which is exactly why you guys are here at 8 in the morning in Vegas Vegas trying to do. You are trying to learn so that you can go back and make some decisions so that your business gets run most effectively. And the reason why is because you've got people that rely on you. You've got customers, you've got vendors, you've got suppliers, partners, employees. These people are relying on you and their families, by the way, because of their livelihoods. They're hoping that you're not going to screw things up. So you've got to be looking at what's going on around the world and making your decisions as well. And that is exactly what we'll talk about today. Now, I was told because of the schedule, I can go until about 11 a.m. Is that okay? Just kidding, just kidding. I'll be done before nine, okay? What I want to do is I want to talk to you guys about some of the biggest issues that are impacting businesses in America this year, your business, and what, more importantly, the owners and managers are doing about it. Because you know the news, you need to know what the strategies are. So please don't view me as some kind of an expert or knowledgeable person or even a smart person. I'm wearing these glasses because it makes me look smarter. That is the only reason why. That's not the case, though. The case is the fact that I'm going to be reporting back to you what some of the smartest business people that I interview that are my clients are doing this year. So first of all, we'll ask you about this. True or false? Prices are rising. Right. We all know that is true, right? So, you know, you know, inflation obviously is our biggest issue that we have this year. Now, when you read the news, the news that I am reporting to you in the places that I write, this is what you are reading. You are reading that inflation rose 7.9%, the highest that it's been in the, most, in, in the last 40 years. But please know that this inflation rate itself, that's not the number that you want to be focusing on in your business because that's a, that's a trailing indicator. That is what has happened already. The leading indicator that you should be paying attention to every single month is the producer price index. The producer price index is what is costing manufacturers, your suppliers, your vendors, your people that you are buying from to make the products that you are selling because this index is what ultimately gets passed down onto consumers. That's you and me as buyers in the future. And right now, the government is reporting that index is 10% over the past 12 months. However, I am betting that when you look at that and you think about a 10% rise in increase, it, it, because you are like everyone else that I'm talking to in so many other industries, you're probably not seeing that 10% increase. In fact, you're probably seeing a lot higher increases in the core costs that you are paying to manufacture and even to distribute the products that you are selling right now. That is because the producer price index is made up of thousands of different things, not weighted very well. What you're interested in is the cost of things in your industry. So let's talk about some of those costs. 
The cost of metal and metal products, which are used in some of the products that you sell, have increased 21% in the past year. The cost of coating that's engraving and you know, allied services along that have increased about 11% this year. The cost of polyethylene film and sheet has increased about 30%. Vinyl and, and film itself that goes into the tiles and the materials that you make and sell have gone up 32%. The same thing with unlimited plastic film and sheet. The same thing with film and sheet manufacturing. Plastics materials and resins manufacturing have increased 19% this year. These are all things that wind up in the core products that you are selling and those costs themselves have gone up way more than that 10%. Industrial chemicals, which are all also a core part of not only the stuff that you sell, but also the stuff all around us here, a 26% increase this year. So when you see this, you are seeing costs that are well and above 10% that is being reported by the government. And I can go on with more of the data, but you already know this. You already know this. You also know that the cost of freight and trucking and shipping has also gone up 29%, and that is just to ship products once they've landed here in the US, let alone the cost of those products since they were shipped from wherever they were in China and Europe. They're looking at a 29% increase in those costs just within the past year as well. Turning to labor, the average hourly worker now makes more than $30 an hour. The average starting wage, starting hourly wage in this country is now in excess of $15 an hour when you take into account all the metropolitan areas in the country, way more than the $7.25 of minimum wage that you read. Overall, hourly wages have increased about 6%. Wages and compensation is what drives inflation because your employees and employees of other companies, they're the ones that are asking. If they have an expectation that inflation is going to continue to rise next year, they are going to be coming back to you asking for salary increases so that it will compensate for that rise going forward. Otherwise, you will lose them. When you have that expectation built in, that is the type, of thing, the type of thing that drives inflation going forward. But it's not just hourly wages. Overall compensation of all employees in the private sector, this is uh, you know, salaries, uh, benefits, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, bonuses, sales commissions, 10% increase this year, 10%. And that was just over the past 12 months. All of that, all of this information is, is bubbling up into an increase in prices that's impacting your business. Now, I do, uh, you know, that, that, that doesn't even include what is going on you know, in Washington right now. And what's going on in Washington is an unprecedented level of money that is washing around in our banking system. The Federal Reserve's balance sheet has increased over six trillion dollars since the beginning of the pandemic. And that increase at the very beginning was for good reasons, because it provided liquidity to our banks and financial systems whenever there was a, uh, you know, so the people weren't running on the banks or the ATMs when they needed money and the collapse that occurred when COVID happened. So that's a good thing, but the liquidity continued well after that. Not by just the, the Fed making the money itself easy to get, but we've had trillions of dollars in stimulus money that has been spent or to be spent, which is now there, out there in the system, waiting to come into the system. If this money comes in too fast, if it's lent out by the banks or circulated by the banks into the system, it creates an oversupply of money. When there is too much supply of something over demand, it drives down the cost of that thing. It makes it worth less which is what causes inflation. So the, so the Federal Reserve right now, their biggest and really their only tool they can do is to increase interest rates, to limit the amount of supply that comes into the system because people will borrow less money. Right now, interest rates are very low. The Fed has already uh, announced that they're going to be moving a, like a half a point increase in interest rates. Many economists expect interest rates to be going up significantly over the, last, over the next couple of years. A typical business loan right now, just like a, a mortgage, is anywhere from 3 to 4% on average right now. Many economists are expecting over the next two years, me as well, to see interest rates increase to as much as 5 to 7%. Hopefully not into 
the double-digit realm, but action has to be taken by the Fed to try and whittle down their balance sheet and also limit the amount of money that's going around in the system. So we've got the supply chain issue that's causing all these increasing costs I just discussed about in this, in this industry. We've got uh, you know, other factors. Obviously, the war in Ukraine is having an, an, you know, an impact on energy prices. We've got uh, shutdowns in China that's going on right now, which is hitting certain manufacturing regions. So that's limiting supply, which will increase prices. And then we've got the Fed itself trying to figure out to do with this mountain of money that's potentially you know, circulating into the system and how to control that. That. All of those things are having an impact on inflation, and that is why we are seeing prices go up now, and why we will continue to see prices go up around the same percentage, 8 to 10 percent at least, over the next six to nine months. That is what you can expect in your business. By the way, before you get too depressed, one thing I do want to tell you is that the actual price of alcohol has decreased 0.5 percent since the beginning of the pandemic. So it's not all bad news. It's all good. You know, you can just keep that in mind. All right. None of this stuff that I've explained to you it should come as a surprise, right? I mean, this can't be new. You read the news, right? I mean, you're running businesses here. You're running a household, but you understand some of this stuff. That's fine, okay? The big question is this. What do you do about it? What do you do? I mean, any economist will get up, and they'll, they'll tell you all what the news is. They'll make the predictions. You know the predictions. You know the price are going to be increasing this year. What do you do? Well, that's what I'm going to tell you. This is not, again, like I said earlier, my advice, I didn't come up with this out of the air. What I want to share with you is, is, is what business owners are doing in this industry, and frankly, no offense, you're not so special. Your industry is whatever your industry is, but you've got the same headaches and issues that anybody running or managing a business is, regardless of an industry. What are businesses doing in 2022 to navigate their way around inflation, around this higher cost environment? That is what I'm going to share with you. Now, Hopefully you'll implement some of these ideas, uh, most of these ideas. Just know there's no silver bullet. There's not one thing you can do to, you know, to, to, to bring yourself around. But there are multiple things that you should be doing. So let's jump into them. Okay, number one, my best clients are doing something that their parents and their grandparents couldn't do 20 or 30 years ago. One of the biggest differences between running a business in 2022 versus 1982 when inflation and interest rates were so high is data. We have a lot of it, a hell of a lot more than we ever had over the past 40 years. So what are my best clients and readers doing? They're leveraging their data. They are digging into their customers, their product lines, and the margins that they are using, and they are figuring out which customers are the best customers to sell to, which product lines are the most profitable to them, which margins themselves they should be maintaining or not maintaining, and they're targeting. My best clients are not just saying, we're going to have a 6% price increase to all of our customers, because some customers might not be thrilled about that. You might not want to lose those customers. So they're looking at those customers that are most and least profitable. They're looking at those product lines that are driving the highest level of profits for them and who's buying those products. And they're targeting price increases. It is not uncommon for me to see uh, you know, businesses saying, for this customer, we're going to increase their prices on their products 3%. This person's going to be 5%. This person's going to be 7%. Because you've got the data to figure that out now. You can track that. So target your price increases to specific products and customers, you will have much more success in doing that. Leverage the data that you have to make intelligent decisions, because that's what intelligent business owners are doing. That's number one. Number two, my clients themselves and my readers are tightening up their communications. They are doubling down their messaging to their customers. They are leveraging their CRM systems, their customer relationship management systems, because they have this technology, again, that didn't exist. 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So now you can not only target those customers that are buying specific products with a certain type of buying pattern, but you should be communicating to them when their price increases are going to happen and when it's going to be. Measuring their responses, responding back to them, adjusting your plans if the response is really tough. But I got to tell you something. 
if you're communicating well with your customers, then they understand. Because you do. You know that you're not living in a vacuum. You're increasing prices on your customers. Other, you know, those customers are increasing prices on their They get it. Everybody gets it. But you know what everybody wants? It's the same thing that you want. They just want to know in advance. It's like, it's like when you're waiting for a flight and it's delayed, you want to know, okay, well, when's it going to take off? Why is it delayed? When am I going to get home? Your customers just want to know their lead times, product availability, price increases in the future. If you tell them three months in advance that you're going to be increasing your prices, they will gratefully acknowledge that. They won't be thrilled, but they get it. But at least they can adjust their own plans and strategies to ensure that they are, uh, you know, they're doing what they got to do. So communicate with your customers. I'm just, again, this is not me telling you. This is hundreds and hundreds of smart business owners that I talk to telling you this is what they're doing. They're leveraging their systems to communicate better with their customers. Number three, many companies are practicing shrinkflation. Are you guys familiar with what shrinkflation is? Have you like heard this term? Okay, some people have, some people have. Shrinkflation is this. Shrinkflation is when you sell something for the same price, but you sell a little bit less of it. Now that might sound unethical or immoral, but let me tell you something. Our biggest brands are doing that to us right now. And if you don't believe me, you can go to any store. Go to a Walmart, for example. Their great value paper towels used to be 168 sheets per roll. Now it's 120 sheets per roll. However, they're selling it for the same price. If you buy a bag of Doritos, used to be 9.75 ounces. Now it's 9.25 ounces but it's the same price, you get it, right? How about like trash bags, hefty bags, the mega pack used to be 90 bags, now it's down to 80 bags, same price, right? Toilet paper, and this is really not a great situation, right? These Charmin soft rolls, 650 sheets a roll, it used to be, it's now half of that. And the sheets themselves are even a little bit smaller. So it's kind of a catastrophe for some of us, but that's, they're, do, they're doing that as well. And by the way, you think shrinkflation is in common? Jonah Hill is practicing shrinkflation, okay? So you know, it's going on all over the place. You think about that for your business only because that's what I'm seeing other smart business people do. They are looking at their products and services and saying, hey, instead of having a price increase, maybe we sell a little bit less. So a little bit less or provide a little bit less services and that way we can get away. It's the same thing. It's the same thing of raising your prices, but it maintains your margins. So that's another strategy I've seen people use. I've seen a lot of my clients lock in long-term agreements. Now, just to be sure, you know, what supplier is going to guarantee you a price over the next year or two, right? In an inflationary environment, they'd be crazy to do that. But if you make a commitment to buy, if you buy enough upfront, maybe that is something that can be negotiated. Same thing with your bank. I just told you interest rates are going to be going up to like 5 to 7%. It's going to happen within the next two to three years. So if you have short-term variable interest rate loans, you probably want to refinance that and lock it into a longer-term fixed rate loan. Same thing with your leases and your property. Landlords are freaking out about leasing out space. Great opportunity to negotiate a longer-term lease. I just want you guys to know, this will not save you money. Okay, This is not a cost savings mood. All this is doing is it's reducing uncertainty. For the clients that I know that are able to lock into a longer term agreement and they pay more for it or they are able to lock into a longer term lease or a better financing arrangement with an interest rate that's higher, at least they know what their costs are going to be over the next two to three years and that way they can navigate and plan their business around that if that makes sense. So that's just another strategy that I've seen a lot of business owners do. Here's something else. It's a high interest world. I get it that we're going to be paying more in interest. You know, I get that. That's going to be happening. But there's a flip side to that. We will be earning more in interest. So for the past 20 years, it really hasn't been a bit, you know, we could leave cash under our mattresses or lying around the house or, you know, you know, you know, in a bank account, a checking account, earning no interest at all. We don't do that anymore because now we're going to be losing money otherwise. And we need every dollar counts. So dust off those interest-bearing accounts, those money market accounts. If you have uh, the, uh, money that's not very liquid, go open up a certificate of deposit and put it away. Interest will be important starting this year and for the next few years. So you want to be focusing on doing that. 
Revisit your portfolio, not only for your business, but also personally. T-bills are good to hedge against inflation. Utility stocks are very good to hedge against inflation because utilities are going to charge whatever they're going to charge, right? Equities or commodities, first of all. You know, I don't want to don't put all your money into gold or silver or whatever, but, you know, they're volatile, but those types of commodities tend to do well in an inflationary environment. Most importantly is equities. I mean, go, read what Warren Buffett is doing now, what his advice is for inflation. He invests in, in blue chip stocks, Fortune 100 or Fortune 200 mutual funds. Why? Because do you really think Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and Jamie Dimon and Elon Musk are going to let inflation get the best of them? Do you really think that? I mean, they will raise prices. They will fire employees. They will replace people with machines. They will cut overhead. They're going to do whatever they're going to do to report earnings back to their shareholders. So you might as well be one of those shareholders, which is why in an inflationary time, those blue chick stops that are run by those types of people that have those types of reporting requirements, not a bad bet in an inflationary period of time. So revisit your portfolio, not just business, but also personally. By the way, I mentioned T-bills before. Be aware that there's something called TIPS, which is Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. So if you do want to put a portion of your savings into T-bills, talk to your, your financial advisor. They're, they get adjusted for inflation. So like a T-bill has an interest rate that it pays, but as inflation goes up, as reported by the government, it will adjust that interest rate you know, automatically. So TIPS are a good thing that you might want to consider investing in, at least just as a portion. Next, buy property, buy equipment, and buy inventory. Property and equipment, if you have that in your business, those are the types of things that tend to grow and keep up with inflation. Inventory by bulk, because we are no longer living in a just-in-time inventory scenario. That was all great over the past 20 years, but the world has now changed. It's now just in case, which means that you want to make sure you have enough inventory on hand just in case you're going to need it for a customer. Now, when I tell you to buy this guy, don't buy crypto for God's sake. You know, don't buy GameStop shares. You don't know nothing about that. No offense, okay? But you know your inventory. You know the products that you sell, and you know the customers that you sell. And I see, I see a lot of my clients that put money into like crazy stuff that they have know nothing about when they should be sinking money into something that's their livelihood, that they know everything about. And you know everything about the tiles, the coverings, the products, the stuff that you're selling. That is the stuff that you should be investing in and laying, laying it out. Now, you might say to me, hey, that sounds great, but like, where am I going to find the money to do all of this? I don't have the money in the, to, 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 you know, to, to bulk up on this stuff. Get financing. And the place to go to get financing is the Small Business Administration. All the COVID relief is over, so I'm not talking about that. But the SBA has what's called 7A and 504 loans. You can borrow from an SBA banker. You do not get the money directly from the SBA. But you go to sba.org, find an SBA banker near you. Those guys have a quota of loans that they need to, to stay current with the SBA, they need to lend it out to you guys. And they're looking for established companies that have got a track record to lend it out to. They're, you'll still have to do due diligence, but 95% of those loans get guaranteed by the government. So the bankers are like, hey, man, it's fine. You know, you know, let's get the money out there. The rates are at market rates. The terms are anywhere from 5 to 15 years. And you can borrow up to $5 million dollars. $5 million to use for working capital to buy the inventory at a lower price because you know the price is going up, that you know you're going to sell in 6 to 12 months at a higher price. So get the financing from an SBA banker to do just that. Again, this is just what I'm seeing my clients do. Okay, Two more things. One is about oil shocks. So we know that the cost of oil uh, and energy is going up. We see the cost. I was in California yesterday. It was like $6 and something you know, per gallon. It's like, you know, it's insane. The average cost around the country is about 4 bucks a gallon. It's going to continue this year. It's a lot of volatility. Did you, I don't know if you knew this or not. If you bought a barrel of oil in April of 2020 when the, when the pandemic began, it was 21 bucks a barrel. And now it's like 110 bucks a barrel. Okay, we were all in the wrong business, all right? But all right, so it's a volatile situation that people are in when it comes to oil. I'm telling you right now that it's not just the, the price of the pump. It's a lot of things that affect your business. 
All of these business costs are petroleum-based. All of them will be going up in 2022. All of them will be going up this year. So you need to make some moves to make sure you protect your business against these increases. So what moves do you need to make? Well, for starters, utilities. I don't care if you're running a distribution facility or a warehouse of 60,000 square feet or just a small you know, retail operation of, of a few thousand square feet. Get a utility audit. Google utility auditors or utility consultants. It is a boutique industry of people. You will, sell, you will send them your last six months of utility bills. They will review them. They will find mistakes in your billing because, spoiler alert, the people that are doing the billing at these utility companies, right? You know, I mean, they make mistakes. And when they do, they'll go to the utility companies and get the money back for you. They'll probably take 30 to 50% of the money that they get back, but good for them, that's what they do. You're not paying them anything out front. More importantly, they're then preparing you for the future so that you've got your utility bills in set as, as utility costs go up. Number two, every utility post, uh, company that I know provides audits. So you can go to your utility company and they will do an energy audit of your facility. They will point out, fix that broken window. You need more insulation here. You should turn down the temperature there. They'll make a bunch of free recommendations for managing your energy costs. And finally, just you're gonna have to increase your overall monitoring. We haven't had to deal with this in a few years. Now we have to, you know, setting the temperature down a bit during the winter, getting a few fans in the office. Every dollar counts to measure what our utility bills because they're gonna be going up. That's number one. Number two is freight and logistics. So if you are shipping to customers around the country, around the world, I just showed you freight costs were up 29% this year. It's gonna to continue to be a rise at that level over the next year. What do you do about that? There's not a lot. So all, the, the, my best suggestion based on the clients that I interview is that they try to share freight costs with their customers. And you can share it temporarily. It's a one-time surcharge. It's a temporary thing. It's just, and some customers will buy into it. Some customers will not, but that's the best I got for you right now, trying to figure that out myself. Number three is office supplies. For, you know, office supply costs, many of them are petroleum based, so you want to, believe me, I know your office supply closet, okay? It's a catastrophe. You have way too many office supplies. You've got paper, you've got pens, you've got staples, you've, you've way overbought. So stop buying office supplies this year because a lot of that stuff is going, besides people working from home, but should you be all digital anyway? So you know, those costs themselves have gone up significantly. And then, of course, there's travel. Uh, not, you know, very good of you that you came all the way to Vegas for this conference. I don't know what else you've got traveled for the rest of the year. You might want to buy those plane tickets early because those prices are already starting to spike and that's going to be a continuous issue throughout the year. You might need to hold back on travel. Put it, COVID aside, you might need to hold back on travel this year because the costs themselves might not, you know, might be going up. And which brings me to work from home, which I'll address a little bit later, but working from home policies, they save your employees money if the more they can work from home because if gas is four or $5 a gallon, it's costing them. So it's coming out of their pockets. That's not gonna make them happy. They could be coming back to you for reimbursement as well. So work from home policies is another thing I'm seeing clients do more so. All of these stuffs, the solvents, lubricants, these are all, if you have any of this stuff in your facility, all the core stuff that might be made using any of this stuff, people are just buying bulk, they're buying refrigeration and fan belts, they're getting their maintenance checked, and they're pushing aside construction projects as well, because those construction projects, you know, paints, rollers, construction materials are all part of all of this. All of this stuff, is 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 all options that you have, and yet I'm I'm missing the number one uh, the number one thing you should be doing. All the case is this, and that's investing in technology. Anybody here? Because uh, we're in Vegas, I talk about this a lot. I, I, I'm happy to be in Vegas. Anybody stay at the Paris Hotel uh, here? Just kind of curious. Anybody at the Paris Hotel? Okay. If you went, I don't know what hotels you guys are at, but I was at the Paris Hotel like a month ago when I was here. If you go to the Paris Hotel and check, you know, it's like a cluster, you know what, when you check in these Vegas hotels, it's like, you know, whatever. So, they, you know, you go to the Paris Hotel, there used to be like 15 people behind the desk checking people in. One person behind the desk now, 12 self-service kiosk machines to check in. I don't know if you guys saw this at your hotels. You put in the confirmation number, you feed in your driver's license, spits out your room key, you're going up to your room. 
Why is the Paris Hotel doing it? It's doing the same thing that businesses all around the country are doing. They're replacing employees with machines. There are 11 million unfilled jobs. We are looking to keep our overhead and our employment costs as low as possible. So when I look at manufacturers and distributors, and some of you guys are in that boat right now, they're doing things like putting robotic arms at five to $7,000 a pop to do packaging for them without using an employee. They are using autonomous vehicles to go around their warehouse. This machine from VCheck costs about 15 grand. I have one client that's got five of them running around the warehouse where they're putting materials on and controlled by one person instead of five forklift operators or five warehouse people. I've got other clients that are using drones in their warehouse and their facilities, regardless of how big, because this drone, which is made by iSense, is a $5,000 unit that does inventory counting, safety checks, barcoding and scanning as well as video of whatever is going on inside of a facility. Again, we've, I've got the manager there has three of these drones under their command. They don't do physical inventories anymore. They just do cycle counts with the drones. They're on top of everything. Nobody walking around the warehouse trying to find in, you know, inventory. So that's another thing people are doing. Another thing, Boston Dynamics just last year reached stretch. They've been sold out of this device. It's a $75,000 robot that companies are using around the country. And you know what they do? They will pack, they will strip, they will seal a box. They will unpack, they will unstrip, they will unseal a box. They will take those boxes and put them onto a pallet. They will pick up the pallet, they will move the pallet to another place in the warehouse. They will unload the pallet, or they will take the pallet, they will put it onto a skid somewhere. All of this is done remotely by somebody in your, some manager, wherever they are, and at $75,000, it saves the cost of a warehouse person which is why people are investing in this stuff, because it's more affordable technology that it's helping people get their work done even sooner. And finally, I have a lot of clients buying. This woman is wearing a Microsoft HoloLens. It's 3,500 bucks. With a few thousand dollars in programming, it provides training, it will provide designs, it will provide spe specifications, it will provide oversight and instructions to any workers wherever they are in your facility. Companies are investing in technologies. They are investing in accounts payable automation technology like Bill.com an active exchange, which takes their accounts payable invoices and scans them in automatically by email and puts it into your accounting system, whether it's QuickBooks or Xero or whatever you're using, automatically without a person being involved. They're investing in HR platforms so that all employees can manage their payroll, their HR stuff, their contact information, their paid time off, their sick days, their performance reviews, all from their mobile devices, and that way they don't need to have an HR people involved in that, which means less time, less people involved in the HR process. And like I mentioned earlier, those CRM systems like Salesforce and Zoho and, and Microsoft Dynamics, they not only improve communications, but they're setting up AI, artificial intelligence in these systems, right out of the box to automatically communicate with customers, respond to requests, send documents, update with information, which means that a customer service or a salesperson doesn't have to be doing that. You guys gotta be doing that. You have to be doing that. All of those ideas that I just gave to you, all of those technologies that I just mentioned, you've gotta be thinking of where you could be saving your time. If you are here and you're, you run a manufacturing or a distribution facility, email me, I'll give you my contact information later. I can make recommendations of vendors that have these technologies for you. But I'm just telling you, like the Paris Hotel, Companies are replacing people with machines. We're seeing it everywhere because the technology has become very affordable to do. And in a high cost environment and in an inflationary world, this is what all the different things that companies are doing this year. I'll come back to you next year. Maybe I'll have some new items. But this is what American businesses are doing to navigate their way around inflation. Okay, let's see what we've learned. True or false, the cost of metals, coatings, plastics, vinyl, and films have increased significantly more than the 10% the government is reporting. Yeah, that is true. So we know that now. We can prepare for that now. True or false, locking in long-term supply contracts is one way to counter potential inflation. 
Also true, right? True or false? SBA Section 7A loans are only available directly from the SBA. False. You got to go to an SBA banker. That's where you get the financing from. They are dying to lend you guys money. They, they have quotas that they have to fill. True or false, up until 1915, it was legal to mail a baby as long as he or she was under 15 pounds. Now, turns out it's false, actually. It had to be under 11 pounds. 11 pounds! It was the good old days, right? Boy, do we miss them. True or false, the diploma that hangs on the wall behind Michael Scott is from the University of Scranton. Yeah, it is false, actually. It's really just the certificate of authenticity that he is the proud owner of a quality Seiko timepiece. That's what it says. And true or false, Arizona Diamondbacks pitcher Randy Johnson once hit a bird in flight while pitching in a game. Yeah, that does turn out to be true. For any of you guys that have not seen this before, this is what happened. I know. Literally hit the bird. Now, as shocking as that is, I've got something even more shocking for you. Randy, you guys remember Randy Johnson, right? Lights out pitcher for the Diamondbacks, World Series winner, uh, you know, Cy Young winner, first round ballot to the Hall of Fame. The guy is like, you know, he's uh, uh, unbelievable. Well, uh, besides being an unbelievable pitcher, he's also a photography enthusiast. So when he retired from baseball in 2009, he opened up his own small business, a photography business. And true story, that's his business card. Kind of hoping for like a baseball, you know, like a Hall of Fame logo, something like that. Okay. All right, here's what we learned, okay? Revisit pricing, communications, investing in technology, buying, uh, buying inventory and property. These are all among the counterinflation strategies you should be practicing in 2022. All right, you guys are with me, right? All right, we're good? And I went through a lot of stuff, a lot of things, that are, a lot of materials. I'm going to be giving you my contact information. At the end, you get a full copy of this PDF if you want it. That's fine. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. Anybody know who this guy is? Anybody know who this guy is? This guy is Marty Walsh, right? Anybody from the Boston area? He's the former mayor of Boston. No, he did not co-star in The Departed with Matt Damon, okay? He was the former mayor of Boston. Big union guy. Marty Walsh is now our Secretary of Labor, and he is doing some things right now that are going to be coming down the pike that will be impacting both your business and mine. Remember, great small business and you know, managers are always looking ahead. Well, let me tell you what's coming down the pike. The first has to do with minimum wage. Minimum wage is up in 26 states. If you look at this chart, everybody that's green or orange has experienced that no, I'm sorry, that's where marijuana is legal. So I, I, sometimes I get this confused. That's not the minimum wage graph. I put that in there by mistake. Oh, there, that's the minimum wage graph, okay? Everybody that you see that's orange, every state, has had an increase in the minimum wage. Obviously, the federal minimum wage of $7.25 is a pretty low number. And like I told you earlier, the average minimum wage is about $15 an hour nationwide. There was a movement to increase the minimum wage this year. Well, uh, Marty Walsh and the Department of Labor are pushing for more legislation to try and increase it as a national minimum wage. Let me tell you that right now, it, is, it does have bipartisan support. The, there are good arguments on both sides of people that support it and oppose it. I interviewed Rand Paul just a few weeks ago. He is against increasing the national minimum wage. I know he's got some other controversial views, but the guy's the ranking member on the Senate Small Business Committee, and his point of view is, hey, listen, I don't think it's fair that, that businesses in my home state of Kentucky should be paying the same minimum wage as businesses in Los Angeles or in New York. It should be a local issue. It's a legitimate response. However... There is this big movement to increase minimum wages, and even the Trump administration supported an 11 to $12 an hour minimum wage. Be prepared for more legislation that could do it. It impacts all of your costs. If you are paying somebody now 16 bucks an hour, and the minimum wage in your state is $7.25, they're like, look at me, I'm valuable, I'm more than twice the minimum wage. If the minimum wage goes up nationally to $12, $13, $15 an hour, what is that guy gonna be saying, right? He's like. I'm only making a, a dollar more than some entry level kid. I deserve an increase too. So an increase in the national minimum wage has an impact on all wages. Keep an eye on this legislation coming back, most likely in 2022, and that will depend whether or not the Republicans take, you know, have more of a, take back the Senate. 
uh, and have more of a control over the House of Representatives, but that will be something to keep an eye on. Number two, expect 6 to 8% salary increases this year. We already saw that the average hourly wage went up 6%. You need to be budgeting for that for the remainder of this year and probably into 2023. You need to revisit overtime wages because overtime wages right now, if you're paying anybody in your business a salary and they're not supervising anybody, you know, like a customer service rep or a, uh, somebody maybe in your warehouse or your facility that you have, they're not supervising anybody and you're paying them more than like 35 grand a year and change, you don't have to pay them overtime. So if they work 50, you know, 45 hours that week, you don't have to pay them for the extra five hours. The Department of Labor is going to change that. They want to revert back to the Obama administration. They tried to do the same thing, but they ran out of time. The, the Department of Labor wants to increase overtime wages and will be increasing overtime wages the next year to $47,000, about $47,500, which means that that same employee, if they're making less than $47,000 a year and they're salaried and they're not supervising anybody, that employee will be entitled to overtime. Now, if you don't pay them, by the way, overtime like going to the bank or responding to an email on the weekend, that's overtime. And if you don't pay them the overtime, does that mean that the Department of Labor is going to come after you? Probably not. But will it mean that that employee will report you to the Department of Labor? Yeah, that's probably going to happen. So you have to protect yourself against that. Maybe turn them into an hourly worker or adjust their wages so they're a dollar or so above that limit. But it's an issue that you're going to have to contend with. Worker classifications are now under review both by the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, and the Department of Labor. The Congress tried to get through the PRO Act. The PRO Act failed in Congress. It likely will not be brought up again. So what the Department of Labor is doing is they are cherry-picking certain provisions of the PRO Act as it affects your 1099 workers and potential union employees. 1099 workers... If you have anybody that you are using as a contractor and you are generating revenue off of them, which means that maybe they're doing like specific design work for you or specific installation work and you're just paying them as a 1099 worker, they're not an employee, but you're billing them out, they're part of the revenue of your business, guess what? When this goes through these worker classification rules, you're going to have to classify them as an employee which means paying them employee benefits, paying payroll taxes, and being subject to any regulations of an employee-employer relationship. The Department of Labor is working on that right now. The second thing the Department of Labor is working on is changing for unionization activity. People were thrilled over in New York because an Amazon warehouse unionized, and the Department of Labor is, is way behind expanding that. Again, the National Labor Relations Board has pulled out certain provisions from the PRO Act to make it easier for unions to unionize employees, so be aware of that. Get a safety review in your business as well because the, the OSHA has had a 16% increase in its budget. They are looking for more reporting in 2022 and 2023 from businesses of all size. Call up your insurance company. Ask them to send somebody out to your business to take a walk around and point out any potential OSHA issues because your insurance company, they don't want any more safety issues any more than you want any safety issues. So get that done this year. And finally, hire a workplace consultant. We should all admit that we made a big mistake when we were kids. We all chose the wrong profession. You're in this industry right now. I'm a CPA. If you haven't figured out by the look of this, I am a CPA, right? But we should have done, we all should have been labor attorneys because we would be banking on it, baby, like right now, or at least HR consultants. Because let's face it, there are too many things for us to know. And discrimination, harassment, Me Too, worker uh, scheduling rules, how workers dress, how workers can behave on social media, uh, drugs in the workplace, all of these issues that we're not prepared to deal with. My best clients are spending a few grand going on LinkedIn and hiring an HR consultant to review all their policies and issue a new employee manual. It's, it's again, that is the 2022 workplace. These are all the strategies that, that companies are doing right now to navigate their compensation costs. So let's see what we've learned. True or false, wages will likely significantly increase nationally in the next two years. 
True, right? Minimum wages and overall compensation, we have to make sure we're budgeting for that. True or false, overtime wages will likely increase in the next two years. Also true, the Department of Labor is working on those rules right now. True or false, because the PRO Act failed to pass Congress, there will be no changes to worker classification rules. False, look for changes coming in worker classification rules. That means you're 1099 workers. True or false, there's a village in England that's actually called Arsville. Turns out it's false, but there is a village called Shitterton. And there is another one that's called Scratchy Bottom. True or false, one in a hundred Europeans are conceived in Ikea bed. Turns out that's false. It's one in 10 Europeans, according to Ikea and the New Yorker magazine. And true or false, there is a dog hiding in this leaf pile. Yeah, turns out that it is true, actually. Just in case he can't say it, he is right there, he's been hiding there all along. There he is in the leaf pile. And speaking of dogs, you guys are still with me, right? We're almost at the end, okay? We've talked inflation, cost management. We've talked about some labor stuff. We're good, right? Okay, right? Okay, fine. No, it's early. All right, that's fine. All right. Let me just share with you finally. I know, I know you guys are probably fine with workers. You got plenty of employees. There's people lined up outside your door applying to your business. So it's all good, okay? There's no, it's, it's all good. But just on the off chance that you might be going through what every other business in this country is going through and trying to find people that not only can do a good job but actually show up to work, let me share with you what some of the hotter benefits are that employers are providing for their workers to attract the best ones. Okay, I got seven of them and I'll go through them quickly because you've got to be doing the same in some way, shape, or form. Number one, of course, is health care and retirement. You all know that. Health savings accounts. Get them for your company. They're inexpensive to set up. When you have an HSA, it's like a 401k for your employees. They can put money away pre-tax. You put money away. They, put it, they can use it for unreimbursed medical expenses. Employees love it. Get an HSA. If you don't want to provide health insurance anymore because you're sick and tired of the administration issues and who wants to even get involved in your employees' health issues, for God's sake, get rid of your health insurance plan and start an HRA, health reimbursement account. I'm seeing this all over the place with my clients. You put the same money away that you're spending on. It's not saving you any money, but you're putting it away pre-tax like you're doing now. Your employees, who promise they will use it for their health care, can then take that money and get their own health care. They can go to the Obamacare exchanges. They can go to a list of brokers that you provide them. So you're giving them the same benefit, but letting them choose what kind of health care they want to get. And therefore, you don't even have to be involved. And you can save on the administrative and the headaches issue of that. I'm seeing a huge number of businesses do that. And then, of course, there's 401k retirement plans you want to provide. Flexibility is the big, is the big you know, buzzword of 2022. I don't care if it's work from home, if it's a four-day work week, if it's unlimited paid time off. You need to be providing flexibility for your workers. I'm telling you guys, the millennials were right. They were saying to us before COVID, we need to work from home more. We want more independence. We want more flexibility. Guys like me, because the average small business owner is over the age of 50, were like, shut Shut up, come into the office and do your thing. You're going to do it the way I did it when I was younger, right? So just like know your place, right? Then COVID hits, everybody has to go home, and what do you know? It works, right? The cloud works, they're working responsibly, they're independently, they're all, they're doing it. They were right, okay? I mean, can we admit they're smarter than us, all right? They know more, they're up to date on the technology, they know what they're doing, they want that flexibility. 50% of the workers in this country now are either millennials or Gen X, Gen Zers. Gen Zers or anybody born after 1995, like my kids, they're in their 20s, right, in the workplace. You gotta provide them some type of hybrid work from home. Maybe if you've got hourly workers that they, they gotta be in the office, maybe consider a four day work week, 10 hour shifts or 12 hour shifts. That works pretty well in the healthcare industry. You've got to provide some type of flexibility for your employees. Number three. Hiring bonuses. I know that you're looking for good people. So here's what you do. Talk to your accountant about the work opportunity tax credit. Why? Because if you hire anybody this year through 2025 and you, 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 they're out of prison, 
they're out of, off of welfare, they came out of the military, or they've been unemployed for the past six months, you get a tax credit on the taxes that you owe of up to $9,600 per employee that you hire. So you talk to your accountant before you hire that person and you say to the accountant, listen, I'm going to hire this person. I'm going to pay her 50 grand a year. What's my work opportunity tax credit? The accountant will do the math and say, it's going to be five grand. You go back to that person and you say, listen, come on board with us, not the guy down the street. I'll give you a hiring bonus of three grand after you're with us for 60 days. You're still $2,000 ahead. So before you make any hiring decision, Talk to your accountant about the work opportunity tax credit and offer a hiring bonus. Number four, you have to provide some type of mental health benefits for your employees. I recommend Better Up. It's a platform. You pay an annual fee. Your employees go there. They get their, you know, you know, you know they can talk to counselors, psychiatrists, whatever. Better Up, uh, one of the people behind it is Prince Harry. But it's okay because Meghan Markle has nothing to do with it. All right? So consider it. Take a look at it. Great benefit to provide to your employees. Student debt assistant. You can get a five thousand two hundred and fifty dollar deduction every year through 2025 per employee if you help them with their student loans a deduction and they don't get taxed on it so consider student debt assistance as well same day pay don't roll your eyes okay for your hourly workers very very uh, popular you pay them 50 percent of their wages that day by transferring into their bank account, the other 50% they get at the end of the payroll period. It's a complicated transaction, so you will probably need a payroll company like an ADP or a Paychecks or a Paycor to help you. But think about it, you're trying to get that hourly worker and you're like, hey, we'll pay you 50% of your wages that day, as opposed to the guy down the street, he's not doing that. That could be the difference to attract that person to your company. And finally, and lastly, employee ownership. Guys, I don't care how big your company is, there's been an explosion in ESOPs around this country. You can sell a portion of your business, 25% of it, to your employees. You sell it to a separate entity that your employees owned. A bank finances the sale. You get a check from the bank for 25% of the value of your business. You're part of that employee group. So any earnings that go, that 25% that goes to that group, it's tax-free. And whatever payment you make to the bank is a tax deduction. So guys, I'm telling you, I just did a big piece on this for the Philly Inquirer. I interviewed like 10 business owners across the board. They said it was the best decision they ever made. You can have 10 employees in your business or 1,000 employees. Doesn't make a difference. Go to employeeownershipequals.org. It's a nonprofit site. Go and talk to one of those people there and tell them your situation. The biggest benefit besides the getting paid out and getting a tax benefit, your employees get equity in your business. People love that stuff. It is the narrative of this year. So you're trying to attract that great worker and you're like, come and work for us. You do a good job after a year, you can be a part owner of this company. What a great story to tell and a great way to attract a worker to your business. This is what, again, as a reporter, this is what people are doing right now to attract employees to their businesses. Small, small businesses and large, large companies all in different way, shapes, or forms. So, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to skip by it. That was, that was uh, an ESOP slide that I'm not going to spend time on. So, these are the top seven benefits. Talked about that. Let us recap. True or false? HSAs are very popular with employees. These are health savings accounts, a 401k account, like a, for, your, for your health insurance, you want to provide it to your employees. It's true or false, student loan assistance are not popular with younger employees. False, right? We have an entire generation that's buried under the student loan debt. True or false, to start an ESOP, you have to sell 100% of your shares. False. Sell a portion of your company, maybe 25% of it. Huge tax benefits and a great benefit to provide to your employees. And true or false, according to the Journal of Microbiology, 80% of fast food drink dispensers contain fecal matter. Okay, relax, calm down. It's only 50%, okay? People think, 
oh my God, 80%, so, but it, it's only 50%, so you know, that should make you feel better. And true or false, Viagra makes flowers stand up straight? Yeah. Turns out it's true, and it contains nitric oxide, which is a chemical that's at the heart of the drug. It actually makes flowers stand up straight. The results are, it's really unbelievable. All right, so <laughs> let's see what we've learned. All right, and we'll wrap things up. You want to revisit pricing, communications, invest in technology, buying inventory and property. Those are all the different things we talked about that'll counter inflation this year. Number two, to counter rising labor costs, budget for salary and overtime increases, revisit your independent contractor arrangements, engage outside consultants for workplace and safety, and finally, health insurance, retirement, hiring bonuses, flexible scheduling, mental health, student loan reimbursement, same day pay, these are all among the hottest benefits to attract and retain your employees this year. Make sure you're doing some or all of these in some way, shape, or form. Remember, always gotta be looking ahead. Okay. My best clients, they are thinking of the repercussions of their actions. And they are making decisions now on both hiring and investing and spending that impact their businesses in the years to come. So always be thinking ahead. Finally, true or false. You are much smarter than you were just 90 minutes ago. Yeah, yeah, that is true. That is true. Here is my contact information. If you would like a copy of this PDF, if you'd like to ask any questions, um, or if you'd even like some recommendations of some of the technology vendors that I even mentioned, feel free to email me and I'll be happy to send it back to you. I am out of time. Guys, thank you very much for everything. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Take care.